In this video, we'll be talking about how dogs learn and think. Understanding this is really important before you begin the training, right? If you attempt the training without understanding this first, you're going to run into issues and then you're not gonna have the mental tools required to problem solve those issues as they arise. So let me give you an example. This would be like if I was teaching you how to build a model airplane from scratch, right? And I was like, okay, you need a wing that looks like this, go and buy this, and then you attach it to the body, it looks like this, right? And you attach it using this, just like this, right? And I show you how to do it. I show you what to do. And then when you go out and try to fly your airplane, it's going to crash. And when it crashes, if you don't have the mental tools required, if you don't understand the principles of flight mechanics, if you don't understand thrust and lift and drag and weight and all those other things, right? If you don't understand that, when your airplane crashes, you're not gonna know what caused it exactly. You're not gonna know the core of the problem, right? So without understanding it from a first principles way, you are going to lack the ability to solve it efficiently and productively, right? So that's what this video is. Because the problem with a lot of dog training and a lot of dog trainers these days is they don't take the time to teach the client this. And this, in my opinion, is the single most important thing when it comes to creating long-term success for client and dog, right? And that's because there will be a point in your life with your dog where your dog is exhibiting behaviors, problem behaviors, you wanna teach them new behaviors, right? They're doing something you don't quite understand it. And if you don't have the mental tools, the mental frameworks to work within and visualize it properly, when you go to solve the problem, it may not be the most effective way of solving it, right? So that's what this video is. It's meant to teach you the theory, the foundation behind how dogs learn and think. So when you go through the training, it makes sense, okay? All right, so we have a little agenda going on here. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is classical conditioning. We're gonna talk about operant conditioning, the three-term contingency, genetics, and learned behaviors. So we got a lot to cover. Let's just jump right into it. So the first thing we'll talk about is classical conditioning. So what is classical conditioning? If you guys took a psych class in college, you may remember this, but there was this guy named Pavlov, okay? And he figured out that if he presented a dog with food, they would show the behavior of salivation, right? They would begin to salivate, right? They like, present the dog with food, dog salivates. Food salivates, right? And they didn't have to teach the dog this. This was already a conditioned behavioral response. This is the behavioral response here, okay? Now, what he figured out is if he took a bell, something that wasn't conditioned, right? This had no meaning to the dog. When the dog heard the bell, the dog didn't do anything. Uh, this was a neutral stimulus, right? The bell. He figured out that if he took the bell and then presented the food a second later, the dog would begin to salivate, right? And if he just kept repeating this over and over again, bell, food, salivate, bell, food, salivate. Over time, eventually, he figured out that he could take out the food. And when he rang the bell, the dog would begin to salivate. He figured out that he could condition this stimulus to the behavior, right? And the reason why I'm telling you this, you guys this, is because we use classical conditioning in dog training, right? If you've ever wondered how dogs pick up commands, right? Isn't it weird how like we can tell a dog to down? The word down doesn't mean anything to the dog, but they figured out that down, when they hear that from our mouths, they can get into this position, right? Isn't that crazy to think about, right? We can just give them this command and then they do this behavior, right? It's very interesting to think about it like that, but how we train that is through classical conditioning, right? That's how we teach new commands. And so when we go through the uh, how to communicate with your dog, which was the next video after this one, this will start to make a lot more sense and I'll show you real examples of me training behaviors with dogs, and you'll learn how to use classical conditioning in the training to teach new behaviors, all right? So that's classical conditioning. We're keeping this pretty high level here. Uh, I don't wanna get super in depth in any specific point. I just wanna give you guys the essentials, the stuff that you need to know in order to train your dog effectively, okay? Another example of this, by the way, of uh, classical conditioning is, let's say you're walking down the street, right? You're not paying attention, and then you hear a, ding in your pocket, right? Little ding. What 
what is that? Well, 100 years ago, that would have just been a neutral stimulus, the ding, right? But today, you've been conditioned, right? That when you hear that ding, that is a notification on your phone, right? And so when you hear the ding, the dopamine in your brain starts rushing and all that, right? Because you anticipate that reward or whatever, so to speak, right? So that's a good example of just us being classically conditioned in this world today, all right? So hopefully you understand that. If it doesn't make sense right now, it's okay. It'll make more sense uh, in the how to communicate video, which is the next video. And then as you go through the training, you'll learn how to teach these behaviors and the timing and all that stuff, right? I just wanna give you guys a high level framework of what classical conditioning is. All right, next thing we're talking about, operant conditioning. Now, what is operant conditioning? Well, it's another useful framework that we work within. And let me go ahead and show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna start out by drawing a two by two grid here. All right, and then on the top, we have reinforcement and punishment. And then on the left, we have positive and negative. Okay, so let's go ahead and define each of these terms, and then we'll define each quadrant, and I'll provide you with examples to better understand them. So reinforcement is something that's something that increases the frequency of a behavior. It increases the odds that that behavior is going to repeat again in the future. Punishment is something that decreases the frequency of a behavior, reduces the odds that that behavior is going to repeat again. Positive and negative doesn't mean good and bad. Positive in this context means to add. Negative means to take away or remove, right? That's what it means in this context here. So let's go ahead and define each of these quadrants. So we have positive reinforcement. Something is added to increase the frequency of behavior. Positive punishment. Something's added to decrease the frequency of a behavior. <clears throat> Negative reinforcement. Something is removed to increase the frequency of a behavior. And then we have negative punishment. Something's removed to decrease the frequency of a behavior. All right, so let me go ahead and give you some human examples of each of these quadrants because I think it'll help you better understand um, sort of how this works. So let's imagine, as a society, we decided it would be a good idea if everybody wore their seatbelts, right? This is a conclusion we came to after looking at the data. So we all get together and we try to figure out, hmm, how can we get individuals within the population to wear their seatbelts when they're driving? How can we best do this? Well, one method would be positive reinforcement. You know, what if every time, you know, someone put on their seatbelt, we give them a dollar or something, right? Or something like this. Well, hmm, you know, that might work. You know, we reinforce the behavior. We add something, the money, to increase the frequency of the behavior, which is putting on the seatbelt. Hmm, that might work, right? But uh, that might be kind of expensive, okay? So that would be positive reinforcement in that, that situation there. Negative reinforcement, hmm. What if, you know, when they got in their seat car and they just drove off without putting on their seatbelt, what if we made something annoying? What if we just made a ding, 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 right? Very annoying. What would happen? Hmm, we can make it so that to turn that off, they put on their seatbelt. Hmm, right? And then we can negatively reinforce the behavior of putting on the seatbelt. We remove the pressure, the sound, right? But the pressure, right? The the sound pressure, we remove the pressure and we negatively reinforce the behavior of putting on the seatbelt. Great, right? So you can see reinforcement, we're trying to reinforce the behavior of putting on the seatbelt. Okay, now what next? Positive punishment, what might that be? Well, we add something to decrease the frequency of a behavior. So what might this be? Well, let's make it so if someone is driving around without a seatbelt and they get caught, we give them a ticket. Okay, so they get a ticket. What happens there, right? We add something, the ticket, the fine, onto the behavior of not wearing your seatbelt, right? So that's the click it or ticket, right? That's what it is here. Positive punishment for not wearing your seatbelt. What's negative punishment? We remove something to decrease the frequency of behavior. So, hmm, how can we make sure people don't, people do not 
not wear their seatbelts, right? How can we make sure people don't drive around wearing no seatbelts? Well, let's say imagine you know you get a lot of tickets here or something for not wearing your seatbelt. If you get enough tickets, right, maybe three or something like this, you get your license taken away. Ooh, right, negative punishment. You remove something, you take something away, the license, to punish a behavior, which is the behavior of not wearing your seatbelt, driving around with no seatbelt on. All right, so those are all just, you know, frameworks that we, this is a framework we can work within to change the behavior of an individual, to reinforce certain behaviors, wearing the seatbelt, and punish certain behaviors, not wearing the seatbelt. And by having that structure in place, by rewarding the behavior of wearing the seatbelt and punishing the behavior of not wearing the seatbelt, we can increase the number of people who are wearing their seatbelts, right? And so this is the framework here that we work within, within dog training a lot of the time, right? So when we're thinking about reinforcement, punishment, positive and negative, we can think about this in a dog training context. So let me go ahead and give you all dog examples now, all right? So positive reinforcement, Positive, but first let me go ahead and do that. Before I do that, let me outline the three-term contingency because I think this will help you better visualize everything as I'm going through these quadrants, all right? So the three-term contingency looks like this. You have the stimulus, then you have the behavioral response, Then you have the reinforcer slash punisher, one or the other, all right? So let's go ahead and go through this. So reinforcement, positive reinforcement. What does that look like for dogs in dog training? Well, some of you may have been able to guess, right? We got things like treats, got stuff like toys. How about affection? All right, how about praise, all right? These are all methods of positive reinforcement in the training. You got things like play, all right? So these are all like very typical methods of positive reinforcement in the training, right? As you're going through the training and you're positively reinforcing your dog, this is typically the things that you'll do, right? Give your dog treats, affection, praise, play, all that stuff, right? Makes sense, okay. Now, what I want you to understand as we're working through these uh, quadrants here is your dog's source of positive reinforcement doesn't only come through you. You're not the only source of reinforcement in their life, right? They can get positive reinforcement many other ways, right? And now I want you to start thinking about it. What does your dog like? What things does your dog find positively reinforcing that you aren't giving them to directly, right? Think about it. How about things like other dogs? How about things like people? How about things like swimming, right? <laughs> Some dogs might not like swimming, but your dog might like swimming, right? So you have all these other things, right? How about the environment, right? Like how, how many of you have taken your dog to a new place and they got all these smells, you take them on a trail or something, right? And they're just like smelling around, going nuts, right? All this stuff, all like all these crazy smells, you know, you got the environment, right? So you have all these other things that you can be competing with. How about this one? How about, how about squirrels, right? How about chasing squirrels, for example, right? All right, chasing squirrels or rabbits or whatever, chasing wildlife, right? So you get the idea. Your dog, I'm gonna box this off so you can see it better. There are a lot of things in your dog's life that they can find positively reinforcing. And this brings me to a key principle as we work through these quadrants, and that is your dog decides what's positively reinforcing, not you. So you may have you know, heard somebody on the internet or something be like, okay, yeah, you can just use, you know, your, your affection as positive reinforcement or something like this. Well, your dog specifically might not find affection positively reinforcing. They, not, they might not find your praise positively reinforcing. They might not find treats particularly positively reinforcing, right? And what you'll find with this 
is that your dog decides what's reinforcing, what's punishing, and so on, right? And so it's not up to you to decide. You have to figure out what your dog finds positively reinforcing or punishing, okay? So let me give you guys some pros and cons of each of these as we work through them. So what are the pros of positive reinforcement? Well, the pros are you teach stuff. So this is where all the teaching happens, right? When you're teaching things like the new behaviors, you're teaching the sits and the recalls, and you're teaching them, you know, whatever it is, this is where all the teaching happens. It's where you teach them new stuff, right? New behaviors. That's where it all happens here in positive reinforcement. So we use this a lot in the training. Now, what are some of the downsides of positive reinforcement? Some of the cons. Well, you are limited to the dog's desire or their motivation. <clears throat> You're limited to talking desire or their motivation. Just another way of saying the same thing. So what does this mean? Well, you may have noticed before already, if you're in this program, that your dog usually finds, you know, he might find treats positively reinforcing in low distraction environments, but when he's around another dog, all the training falls apart when you run into competing motivators, right? So, right, in low distraction environments, your dog is motivated for the treats, they like the toys, they like your affection, they like the praise, but when you're in high distraction environments, your dog would rather engage with the environment, go say hi to those dogs, go lunge at those people, right? They would rather do all these things because your dog finds these things more reinforcing than whatever you have. So you're limited to the dog's desire and their motivation to have whatever you have, right? So that's the downsides of positive reinforcement. That's the downside with positive reinforcement training in general. So if you guys have been in the dog training space at all, you've probably heard of a lot of positive only trainers or positive reinforcement only trainers, right? And this is just the fundamental limitations of working within only positive reinforcement is you can get pretty damn close to training your dog. I say about, <clears throat> you may have heard me say this before, but to have a fully reliable dog, it's about 80% motivation and 20% obligation. Right? And what's funny about this is this takes about, you know, this right here takes about 20% of the effort. And this right here takes about 80% of the effort. Right? So it's kind of funny how this works, but you can get pretty close to a trained dog. I'll say fully reliable. You can get pretty close to a fully reliable trained dog with just positive reinforcement, right? You can get about 80% of the way there with just 20% of the effort, right? So it's a very, it's a really high ROI. But the hard part, the part where most people struggle with, the part where most people never get to is a fully reliable dog. And that's where the last 20% of obligation comes in. And that's the hardest thing to work on. That's what requires 80% of the total training effort invested requires the, is in the obligation side, right? So if you might've heard, you know, many positive only trainers out there, maybe you were doing positive reinforcement training before this, what you've probably found is that, okay, your dog's like pretty damn good in specific situations and contexts, but when you run around competing motivators, when you run into competing motivators in the real world, your dog kind of just gives you the middle finger and goes and engages with those things. And the analogy I can give here is a human analogy, right? It's the money, money example. So imagine if, you know, let's say I was with you, for example, for, for the sake of this video, and let's say there was a hundred dollar bill right across the street, and I had five bucks on me. If you stayed with me, you get the five bucks. If you go across the street, you get the hundred. What would you do? you'd go get the hundred if there's nothing stopping you from getting the hundred, right? Why wouldn't you go get the hundred and then come back to me and get the five, right? And so that's in an analogy, that's the, the basis of the limitations of positive reinforcement only training is you're only working on the dog's motivation. You're limited to the dog's desire to have whatever you have and to 
have whatever you know is listed here and you're basically hoping that they don't find these other things more reinforcing than whatever you have right so that's the basis that's the limitations of positive reinforcement only training if you only work within this quadrant and you'll never get to the obligation side of things right the obligations where you teach the dog the concept of must so even though there's the hundred bucks across the street you can't get it you can't you have to stay with me even though I know you would like to you have to stay with me right the concept of must the obligation that's when you are doing the recalls for example your dog is chasing after a squirrel or something they're playing with another dog and you say come the dog understands they must come even if they would rather go chase that squirrel or go play with that dog they must come and that is a completely different thing than the motivation right because you're asking the dog to leave that hundred bill dollar bill over there and come to you to get the five right so that requires a completely different type of training if you want 100 percent reliability um, this is also why you know you won't see positive only trained dogs walking around in off leash high distraction environments lots of competing motivators right where do you see them you see them in low distraction environments they're the trainers do the best to manage the environment around them. They're in like these empty fields, empty trails in their living room. This is why you see that, right? So now you understand sort of the pros, but also the limitations of just positive reinforcement training in general. All right, now let's move into negative reinforcement. Let's talk about that. So negative reinforcement is when you remove something to increase the frequency of a behavior. So let me give you some examples of what that looks like in dog training specifically and what you'll see in this training program. So for this, you'll notice this will be tied to here, but I'll save the explanation for a little later. So this is where you use things like leash pressure, AKA physical pressure. You can use things like verbal pressure, Spatial pressure, etc. here. So what you'll find here is negative reinforcement is really the quadrant of pressure and release. Discomfort to comfort, right? That's what negative reinforcement is here. And so this, these are examples of negative reinforcement in the training. So I don't have a leash with me right now, but for example, I just have this, this flexi leash here. So in the training, for example, when we're teaching a behavior like sit, we begin teaching it with all positive reinforcement, right? It's all done here. And then once the dog understands it, then we start adding some leash pressure to it. So what do we do? We teach the dog that when they feel pressure upwards, when we pull up on the leash, it becomes uncomfortable, right? And then they've learned, we teach them that to turn off that pressure, they sit. And so leash up, means butt down and they learn to turn off the pressure that way right just like with your car seat belt example right and so that's how you start building the obligation right that's the pros of using negative reinforcement in the training is you can build obligation so when your dog when you're working on the recalls for example you'll see it in this video you know your dog's taking off after some ducks you say come, you can use leash pressure, and I'll show you how to do that. You can use leash pressure to get the dog back, and then you reward the dog back in positive reinforcement, but you're using the pressure to build obligation in the training, all right? And you'll learn how to do this as we move through it, okay? Another thing here is like verbal pressure. So for example, let's say you tell your dog to sit, and they down, or they don't sit, right? What you can do is you can make verbal pressure, ah, ah, right? Put the verbal pressure on them, and then that verbal pressure is negatively reinforcing the sit. And then once they sit, good. You can give them praise. Now you're back in the positive reinforcement. So you'll see like whatever, whenever we're training, as you work through this program, pretty much everything loops back to positive reinforcement. Most of the training is positive reinforcement, right? Most of it. It's just that when you use these things, they loop back. Right? Well, you're going to use all of these quadrants, but they all come back to positive reinforcement eventually. All right? So that's the pros of negative reinforcement. We can build obligation in the training. The cons of negative reinforcement is 
if you train only using negative reinforcement, right, only this, only this quadrant, only leash pressure, verbal pressure, spatial pressure, you will have a compliant dog, but you will have a flat dog. And a flat dog is a dog who does what you want, but isn't happy doing it. They lack the motivation, the will to work, right? And you don't want to have a flat dog. You want to have a dog that's motivated, that wants to work with you, that sees you as a partner to work with, right? To cooperate with as a team leader and so on, right? You don't want to have a flat dog who's just obedient, just like moping around beside you and like does all the commands, but isn't happy, right? That's not fun. That's not fun for the dog or for you. So that's why that's the limitations. That's the downsides of negative reinforcement. If you only do this, you will have a flat dog. But if you mix this, with the positive reinforcement, you can build obligation and you will have a dog that understands the concept of must, but is also motivated still to work with you, right? So that's negative reinforcement. Now, positive punishment. What is that? Positive punishment is something that's added to decrease the frequency of a behavior. And now look at this. This is going to trip some people out. Leash pressure, aka physical pressure. Verbal pressure, spatial pressure, and so on, right? So you notice they're the same, right? And why are they the same? Well, it's because to understand pressure in dog training, if you have like, um, let's say this line here is, let's say this line is pressure, this axis, and then this one is like perception of that pressure. So when you're using pressure in training, what you'll notice is it exists on a sort of like an exponential curve like this. And pressure is anything from like, you know, leash pressure, verbal pressure, spatial pressure. These are all just types of pressure, right? For example, like let's take leash pressure, for example. To apply leash pressure here, if you apply like the same level of pressure. So you know you have like these little taps and you have bigger taps and you have big corrections on the leash, right? These are all just different levels of pressure using the leash. But the perception is different for each and every dog as an individual. So for example, right, there is a line that exists where the level of pressure goes from negative goes from negative reinforcement to positive punishment there's a threshold that's crossed, right? Where the dog sees the pressure as no longer merely uncomfortable, but aversive, right? Something very undesirable that, you know, is unfavorable to the dog. The dog deems it as negative, right? And so that's the difference here. It goes from uncomfortable to aversive. And so that's the scale of pressure here. And so that's what you're seeing here when you go from negative reinforcement to positive punishment. And you have to understand this difference as you work through the training, because there will be times where I'm like, okay, when your dog doesn't come, you want to negatively reinforce the recall. And you have to understand where your dog's sensitivity level's at, where their pressure level is at, to negatively reinforce the dog properly. Because you don't want to accidentally positively punish your dog for not recalling, right? These are different things. And you have to understand the difference for you and your dog. As you work through the training, as you work with your dog, you will start to understand where their sensitivity levels lie, right? And that's up for you to do as a dog trainer, right? Because you are now a dog trainer, okay? So you have to work with your dog and find out where their sensitivity levels are. For every dog, it's completely different, okay? So we'll see that there. All right, so that's a quick example of why these two are very similar. It's because it goes from negative reinforcement and then past a certain level, that same pressure becomes punishment, all right? So that's that. Let me go ahead and erase this. But this is also just things that we add, right? There are other things that your dog might find positively punishing, right? So let's say, for example, <clears throat> you know, uh, just to further illustrate the point of your dog decides what's punishing or what's reinforcing, this is, this is sort of a funny one, uh, but I've seen these trainers like, oh, you know, if your dog's doing something you don't like, just spray them with the spray bottle, 
right? I've seen this before and it's kind of silly to me, right? I don't recommend doing this, by the way. This is just for the example. They'll say, okay, if your dog's doing something you don't like, you know, they're chewing on the rug, just spray them with the spray bottle. You know what my dog does with the spray bottle? He loves it. That is probably, it is probably one of his highest forms of positive reinforcement that there possibly is, right? He loves the spray bottle. Like it sends him into a mode where it's like, it's just, it's just, it's just, it just is the thing. You know what I'm saying? He loves that more than a ball, right? He loves, loves, loves catching water out of the spray bottle. It's like his favorite thing ever. So this is just to illustrate the example, to illustrate the point of your dog decides what's punishing or reinforcing. I'll give you a divisive example, okay? Fighting, right? Fighting another dog. If your dog gets into a fight with another dog, they go at it, a real fight, like blood, right? Real intense fighting with another dog. Most dogs would find that very positively punishing. They want to avoid that experience again. It was very un unpleasurable for them, right? Very aversive. So they don't want to engage in that behavior again. Some dogs out there who have been bred for this specifically, fighting another dog is the most positively reinforcing thing that they could possibly do in their lives, right? And so this is just to further illustrate the example, the differences in dogs and so on, right? So another example here, let's, let's do another one here. Let's think of some other ones. Uh, another example of negative reinforcement. Uh, let's get creative. Let's say, oh, here's a good example. Let's say you have a mailman barker, okay? So let's say your dog is, on the, is at your house and when they see the mailman out the window, they see the Amazon driver, Amazon driver gets out of the truck, they come towards the window, what does your dog do? Roo, 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 right? Start barking out the mailman. And then what does the mailman do? Mailman just calmly drops off the package and then walks away. What did your dog do, right? What did they learn in that situation? Well, let's bring the three-term contingency into play here. The stimulus was the mailman, behavior response was to bark at the mailman, and it was met with reinforcement, negative reinforcement. Because once your dog barked at the mailman, the mailman went away. He was removed, right? And so the behavior of barking at the mailman was reinforced. Now next time your dog sees the mailman, this is going to repeat again and again and again, because that's all the reinforcement they needed, right? So, you know, another example here, another stimulus example, let's say your dog sees a squirrel. Behavior response is to chase the squirrel. It's met with reinforcement. Dogs have self-reinforcing behaviors. So, <clears throat> for example, chasing for dogs is self-reinforcing. Barking is self-reinforcing. Digging is self-reinforcing, right? Dogs have self-reinforcing behaviors. So, when your dog sees a squirrel, they chase the squirrel, the reinforcement comes from the act of chasing, the act of the hunt. Even if your dog doesn't get the squirrel, this is still likely to repeat because the chasing in and of itself is reinforcing. Now, if your dog gets the squirrel, he kills the squirrel. Now that's very positively reinforcing, right? So this is a common example with dogs who kill wildlife. They kill birds, they kill rabbits, they kill squirrels. They get it one time, that one time, and that's enough to really get this success mechanism going. Now, every time they see the wildlife, they're anticipating that level of reinforcement. So they just automatically select that behavior response, right? So those are just quick examples there. Now, negative punishment. What is negative punishment? Negative punishment, typically in the context of dog training, is gonna come as withholding, All right? So you're withholding something that the dog desires, or you're removing something. But we typically don't use this one in dog training specifically. We mostly use this one with kids, actually. So let me go ahead and give you what this is. So withholding. Let's say your dog desires the food in your hand. You tell your dog to go to their place. They don't go to their place. You negatively punish the behavior of not going to their place by withholding the food, the thing that they desire. And then so you're negatively punishing that behavior. And then once they go to the place board, you reward them, now you're back in positive reinforcement, right? So you're withholding something they desire. Or you could be removing something they desire. We don't typically use this in dog training because dogs aren't the best at bridging the gap between those two things. We use this a lot with kids. 
So let's say your kid does something that you don't like, you take something away from them that they desire. You take away, you can't play video games today, right? You can't go to your friend's house, whatever it is, right? You punish the behavior by removing something they desire. And so what are some of the pros and cons of these punishment quadrants here? Well, pros are you can remove behaviors here. The cons are you can't teach anything. And I'll explain to you why down here in just a moment. Negative punishment. You can remove behaviors, but you're limited to the dog's desire. <clears throat> and you can't teach anything at the same time. All right? So, example. Why is this the case? Well, when you are punishing behavior, let's go ahead and fall back to the three-term contingency here. Let's say, for example, you're trying to teach your dog not to chase cars. Okay, this is a common issue, especially in city areas, urban areas. This is very typical with herding breeds, especially, right? Stimulus, the car. Behavior response, to chase, lunge, and bark at the car. That is reinforcing for the dog. Not only is it positively reinforcing because they bark and lunge and chase and all that, but it's also negatively reinforcing because the car goes away. They chase that car off, right? And so you have all those things working together to reinforce the behavior of car chasing. So if you want to change this behavior, if you want to change your dog's behavior response towards cars, you are going to have to do a couple things. The first thing you're going to have to do is punish the behavior of car chasing specifically, okay? So what this entails is using some sort of positive punishment to punish the behavior of the act of chasing, lunging, barking, all that stuff at cars. So I'll give you an example. When we were working on this with a Corgi recently, the stimulus was the other cars, behavior response was to lunge at them and bark. We punish that behavior. And when you punish a behavior, a behavior like this, the punishment has to exceed the level of reinforcement that the dog gets from exhibiting this behavior response in response to the stimulus, right? So the punishment has to be greater than the reinforcement they get from this behavior. So dog barked and lunged at the car. We said, no, big leash correction, right? We punished the behavior, this behavior response here. What did that do? Well, when you punish a behavior, all that does is create a hole, right? All you did was create a hole. Now, the dog doesn't know what to select as their behavior response, right? Because that behavior response that they used to select always led to a reinforce always led to reinforcement. It was a productive outcome for the dog. Now we're switching things up. Now that same behavior response is leading to an undesirable outcome for the dog. So what do we have to do now? Well, we as owners, as dog trainers, have to fill this hole with a more productive behavior response, right? So in our case, <clears throat> we are filling the hole with things like neutrality, things like looking at the car, looking away, things like not even looking at the car as it went by, things like looking at the car, then looking at us, all of these things, right? Those were productive behavior responses, and that's what we're reinforcing with food, affection, and praise, right? And so we changed the dog's pathway, his response, towards the cars using this framework. Now, you have to do both. So the, another, a common thing here, uh, I remember when we posted this video, it got a lot of comments like, why wouldn't you just teach your dog to, instead of punishing the dog for chasing the cars, why wouldn't you simply just teach them an alternate behavior, right? Why wouldn't you just teach them to sit and get the sit really good? And then why wouldn't you just gradually get closer and closer to the road, right? Why do you have to punish the dog? And the reason why we punish the behavior of chasing the cars is because we want him to know that not chasing cars is good and chasing cars is bad. It's that simple. If you don't punish the behavior of chasing the cars, the dog will not learn that chasing cars is bad. Chasing cars will still be good, right? It'll be the dog who takes your $5 and then goes and takes that $100, right? It's the same example. And so you have to have both. Chasing cars is bad, 
not chasing cars is good. Those two potential outcomes, right? But you have to punish that original behavior of car reactivity and then fill it with something that's more desirable, right? So you have to have both here. Um, it's the same framework for reactivity as well. All right, so that is operant conditioning. Hope this makes sense. I feel like it was kind of all over the place, but hopefully you were able to you know, understand this framework. I'm sure I will remember later a lot of things that I should have said but didn't. It's okay though. You will fill the pieces as you go through this training program. Okay, and that's three-term contingency as well. Okay, so now let's briefly talk about genetics and learned behaviors. So genetics in dog training, what are they? Well, genetics, uh, what you have to understand about this is that your dog is not a blank slate. So your dog, based on their genetics, is already predetermined who they are. There are certain things that are bred into them that you cannot change. It is foundationally who they are as dogs. So easy way to think about this is breeders. All right, so if you've, if you've got your dog from a breeder or you know anything about dog breeding, you know that breeders are very, very careful with the dogs they select. They select dogs with specific traits, that they breed with other dogs who have specific traits to get the outcome that they want, right? What happens when you know, backyard breeders or people are just breeding dogs willy-nilly, right? What happens is you get a lot of crummy genetics, right? Shaky genetics at best because the dogs who are being selected do not have the traits that produce the optimal outcome. You know what I mean? So genetics in dogs is very important to understand that a lot of your dog is already genetic. So when they're exhibiting these behaviors like reactivity or what, what have you, right? Thresholds, drive, whatever it is, most of your dog is genetic, all right? So it's important to understand that. Now learn behaviors. Learn behaviors are Things that your dog learns a lot of times to, co to cope with those genetic predispositions. So another example of genetics is the sociability levels of your dog. So how social your dog is, how outgoing they are towards other dogs and other people and so on, right? That is a largely genetic component, right? When, if you talk to a dog breeder, for example, right? If you breed two antisocial dogs, the likelihood that you're going to have antisocial puppies is very high, right? And so understanding all of this, the genetics of your dog, and then learned behaviors. Learned behaviors are ways your dog learns to cope with those genetic predispositions sometimes. They don't have to be, but oftentimes the dog is learning to cope with those genetic predispositions in various ways, right? So let's say your dog has a high drive, let's say low threshold, low environmental thresholds, um, you know, and so on. What's the likelihood they're going to be chasing squirrels and wildlife and all that? Probably relatively high, right? So you can understand this going forward. And if your dog learns behaviors like chasing squirrels is very reinforcing, well, now you have the frameworks to work within here, right? Let's say your dog is um, low, low environmental thresholds, uh, high reactivity just genetically. Well, now they're probably going to be exhibiting reactive behaviors from puppyhood onwards, right? You're probably going to see that start to manifest. Like for example, I have a border collie, very reactive, low environmental thresholds, high reactivity. So what does that look like? Well, as a puppy, he would be very attuned to things in the environment and anything that's out of the ordinary, he would freak him out a bit. So I'll give you an example. Today, still, when we walk around the park at night, for example, if there's like a coffee cup on a bench that's around this entire like half mile loop, there's just one coffee cup on this bench that isn't usually there, right? He will just stop whatever he's doing and go and indicate on the thing and like check it out, right? Little, little just sketched out by it. Just very sensitive to things in his environment. Low environmental thresholds, right? When he was a puppy, for example, if there was like a, you know, a, a paper bag on the counter that usually isn't there and he came in and he saw the paper bag, he would start barking at it, right? Because it would freak him out. That usually isn't there. That's not supposed to be there. That's not how it is, right? He notices all these patterns and that any discrepancy in the environment, very attuned to it and then reacts to those accordingly. Very useful for border collies if they're in a herding situation, right? You want them to be very sensitive and attuned to the environment. High reactivity in the environment, right? If you, you can imagine you're on an empty field with just sheep 
It's very beneficial to have those traits. But when you bring that type of dog from that world into this world, right? We're not on a farm, we're in an apartment, we're in the city. You can't be surprised when your dog starts to exhibit these genetic traits and they learn to cope with those genetic predispositions in various ways, right? So that's why you see a lot of reactive herding dogs. You see a lot of reactive Aussies and German Shepherds and so on, right? They're just learning to cope with those genetic predispositions, okay? That's just a brief talk. We don't need to get super in depth with that, but just understand that your dog is largely genetic and <clears throat> understanding who your dog is, is important as you go through the training program. So that's it for this video. Hopefully this gave you a good foundational understanding of how dogs learn and think, and I'll see you in the next video.